Good afternoon. As you've already heard, this lecture will be in English. I'd like to introduce Professor Christopher Riopel. You may know him because he came in 2007 to a summer course where he spoke about the National British Collection. He has a degree from Ottawa University. He completed his studies in Toronto and in New York. He's also been a professor at the Paul Getty Museum in Malibu and also at the Philadelphia Museum. He was also uh, appointed uh, at the National Gallery of London as curator. He's also been a professor in Pennsylvania, New York, and American College of Paris. He's also uh, worked as a coordinator and single curator. The list of all his exhibitions you can find in the folder, but today we want to talk about Ingress Portraits, the Image of a Time, 2099. Sorry. He's also written articles in the Burlington Magazine, Apollo. He's also done uh, for a lot of work for the BBC and the National Gallery in London. He's also lectured in very relevant institutions, British ones, in Europe, Oxford University, and the Campbell Museum in uh, Texas. Apart from participating in different catalogs, he has different publications, uh, encyclopedias and many publications. The lecture is called The Strange Beauty of Ingress. It is a great um, <clears throat> honor and pleasure to be again at the Prado and to lecture in uh, this remarkable collection and to have the opportunity, one of the great opportunities uh, in our field to spend a day um, <clears throat> walking and looking and wandering in the galleries of this uh, extraordinarily great uh, collection. <clears throat> I can only say it must be very difficult to think about leaving. Late in 1824, uh, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang found to his amazement that he was one of the most acclaimed artists in Paris. It had been a long time coming. Born in 1780 in Montauban in southwestern France, he was 44 years old, middle, middle-aged by the reckoning of the times, when overnight he achieved fame at the Paris Salon of 1824. Before that, he had struggled to survive as an artist, at the, uh, as an artist in turn of the century Paris, then lived an increasingly impoverished existence in Rome for 14 years from 1806. For four years from 1820, he had been in Florence. 30 years behind the times, he had declared of the city, only too aware of its provinciality and how far away it was from Paris and success. He scrounged to make ends meet there, for the most part turning out painted portraits or more frequently portrait drawings executed in a matter of hours for modest fees of French or worse, uh, English grand tourists uh, bustling their self-important way across the continent. Now he was the sensation of Paris. His painting, The Vow of Louis XIII, uh, arrived late for the 1824 Salon, but was immediately recognized in the capital as the brilliant synthesis the critics had been waiting for. The king below Louis XIII, who raises his crown and scepter in dedication 
to a sacred vision might have been painted by the 17th century French master Philippe de Champagne. The highly idealized Madonna and child flanked by angels floating above were deeply indebted to models derived from Italian high Renaissance art, which Ang had studied assiduously in Roman Florence. Indeed, the upper part of the canvas might have been executed by Raphael himself, so fully had Ang absorbed the lessons of the Renaissance master he most admired. France dedicates herself to the Virgin. That is the subject of the painting, but it is also French art dedicating itself to the continued primacy of the classical tradition and classical notions of beauty as revived in 16th century Italy. A new impetus had been given to French painting, the critics declared. The antidote to the excesses of romantic, romantic painting had been found. Ang hurried back from Italy to bask in the unexpected acclaim. <laughs> Official honors, not least a medal from the king, and more important, commissions from the state, now rained down on him. The most important commission was for a grand painting for the Musée du Louvre itself. It was meant for a ceiling in that museum's new wing for ancient Egyptian and Etruscan art. In the event it never hung on the ceiling, so compelling was it seen to be upon completion in 1827 as a manifesto of the new classical ideal. It went on the wall instead for instructive viewing. The bard of ancient Greece, Homer, enthroned before an Ionic temple, is crowned with laurel by fame herself. Uh, the poet's features are modeled on an ancient bust. Indeed, there is a Roman copy of that bust in the royal collection and in display uh, in, the, in the sculpture collection upstairs. Uh, many of the, of the figures in this painting are also uh, based on well-known portraits. Impeccable scholarship lies behind the painting. At Homer's feet, in red and green, sit the personifications of the Iliad and the, um, and the Odyssey. Symmetrically disposed around them are the greatest poets and artists of the ages, not only of antiquity, Phidias, Herodotus, Apelles had left, who holds the hand of, uh, of the immortal Raphael. Uh, but this continues up to the 17th century and France as well. There are Poussin on the left, and Moliere and Racine on the right, all gathered to honor the fonds and or at Origo of the classical canyon, canon. Here was a clear statement of those classical concepts of beauty and truth to nature that had been handed down in an unbroken line from archaic Greece to today. Every age that embraced classicism and the notions of beauty which it honored were carried high. France triumphantly among them. Ang here was setting out a clear set of guidelines for the art of today and tomorrow. With this majestic hieratic painting, unflinching in its commitment to classical ideals, Ang secured his position as the chief exponent of classicism in modern France. And yet, with the next major painting Ang showed, it all went wrong. After 10 years' work, long delays, and a publicity campaign uh, managed by loyal, if worried, students to make sure it was well received, Ang's Martyrdom of Saint Symphorium finally debuted at the Paris Salon of 1834. The subject derives from late antiquity. We stand just outside the walls of the ancient Roman city of Autun in southeastern France. The young Christian convert, Symphorien, is being led from the gates of the city amid a jostling throng to his place of execution. Hysterical, his mother cries to him from atop the walls to keep the faith. He swears he will do so even in death. 
Every individual detail of this vast altarpiece is well judged. The city gates are based on Roman runes that still stand. The figure at right might have stepped from a classical relief of the most flawless execution. The violence of martyrdom is not shown. Classicism eschewed such bloody moments. Rather, we focus on the young man's magnificent and inspiring declaration of faith. This time, the critics were appalled, and we can see their point. The painting was declared to be incoherent. Our eyes are pulled back and forth across the canvas from right to left and top to bottom by extravagant gestures and glances in an, an entirely chaotic manner, they said. It is as if Symphorian and his mother are flashing semaphore signals at one another. The martyrs, tormentors might be dancing a jig. There is too much going on, and the viewer spends too much time trying to work out what it means. The calm grandeur of ancient art is replaced here by something altogether too emotional and unconstrained in the critic's opinion. Weird and contradictory energies have been set loose. Ang was crushed by the critical response. Insult was added to injury by the no less monumental painting hang, hanging directly opposite his uh, in the main room of the exhibition. It is by Paul Delaroche, and it was the sensation of the 1834 Salon. Crowds 10 deep pushed forward to see a startlingly realistic depiction of the de beheading in the Tower of London in 1553 of the 17-year-old Lady Jane Grey, for nine days Queen of England, but undone by political intrigue. Her severed head is about to fall into the straw directly in front of us, her brilliant gown to be stained by blood. No one had ever seen anything so intense so thrillingly real. How did it differ from Ang's painting? For one thing, it did not demand we think our way through it. Rather, it was simple and straightforward. Every viewer, even children, could quickly understand what was going on here. Our emotions were immediately engaged by the plight of the innocent girl. Five years before the invention of photography in 1839, it was as if we were looking not at an artistic contrivance, but at something like truth itself, an entirely convincing, visually compelling record of an actual event. Years later, back in Rome, Ang confessed to a friend that he still awoke with nightmares at the memory of the 1834 Salon, crowds pressing to see Delaroche's cheap trick, as Ang thought of it, uh, their indifferent backs turned to his uh, learned uh, and carefully wrought masterpiece. But the rout of 1834, this complete, if momentary, collapse of his reputation in France meant more than that. It revealed the contradiction latent in Ang's commitment to classical art as the source of his own, and in his role as the defender of classic classicism. He could not sustain it. Other uncontrollable currents kept bubbling up in his art. They had from the beginning the jarring incoherence of the San Symphorian altarpiece in the eyes of the critics was merely the latest manifestation. What I would call the problem of San Symphorium uh, asks us to look at the gap between Ang's stated commitment to, classical, to a classical ideal of beauty and the much more ambiguous, undogmatic, and eclectic sense of beauty, often of a very strange kind, that had in fact characterized his art from the beginning of his career. Ang had come to Paris from Montauban in the mid-1790s to study in the most important artist's studio there, that of Jacques-Louis David. 
It was a hothouse of creativity where all the most brilliant and original young artists gathered. The greatest painters of the next generation, including Drouet and Gros, Gérard, Giraudet, Granet, all rubbed shoulders under the tutelage of the master, uh, who, in the approach to the French Revolution of 1789, had returned French art to classical tenets with such masterpieces of patriotic fervor as the Oath of the Herati, which you see, and who, under Napoleon, was the acknowledged dictator of the French art world until driven into exile by his fall. Ang was a valued student entrusted by David to work on some of his most important canvases. At the same time, in his private hours, he was open to the new aesthetic fascinations uh, then being debated among the most adventurous young artists. One of these was primitivism. Connoisseurs were increasingly aware of the kinds of non-realistic painting that had flourished among, say, Greek vase painters or in Italian workshops before Raphael. What was art like before it reached the sophistication of classical perfection? Did it have anything to teach us about authenticity of expression? Ang even turned his hand to painting faux uh, primitive works, such as this. In this scene from the legend of the goddess Venus, every figure, including the horses of the quadruga, is seen in rigid profile. There's little shading or gradation of tone. Rather, we're carried back to before the moment of perfection of Greek art in the uh, 5th century BCE. It is not naturalistic, but it is affecting. The strange yearning gesture of the wounded, wounded Venus toward the indifferent Diomedes adds an unsettling emotional tinge to the scene. The student Ang was also drawn to works of art which lay outside the classical canon, the kinds that were not taught at the academy. We find him seeking out and sketching unexpected models, such as Holbein's portrait of King Henry VIII and a nymph by the French mannerist master Jean Goujon. Both originals date from the 16th century, but by the standards of 1800 were only very imperfectly informed by pure classical and Renaissance models. One reason for Ang's fascination with such works was that a plethora of world art was newly available to him and his contemporaries as the Louvre filled up with works looted by Napoleon's armies and carried back in triumph to the capital. As well, books on the history of art illustrated with engravings of human creativity throughout history were also increasingly available. It would be fair to say that Ang's generation was the first for which the entire history of Western art, classical and non-classical alike, was open for consultation. And Ang proved to be an instinctive eclectic, drawn to the most compelling manifestations of creativity, whether sanctioned by classical tradition or not. Ang said he was a classicist, but what he did was different. Ultimately, David himself would break with his brilliant pupil just because of this wayward and to David's way of thinking, undisciplined manner of proceeding. One of the most striking examples of his eclecticism is Ang's astonishing portrait of the Emperor Napoleon on his imperial throne, a work of 1806. A portrait of the emperor could be a ticket to fame and fortune in Napoleonic Paris. But to contemporary eyes, Ang's contribution was so bizarre uh, that it set back his, year for year, his career for years to come. Napoleon confronts us with an implacable stare, like the god Zeus on Olympus. The sources of the painting are not classical, however, but medieval. One critic called the painting Gothic. And the emotional intensity of our cowering subservience to this deity is almost terrifying. 
Preparing it, Aang surveyed a wide variety of imperial portraiture uh, across the ages, including indeed a, a Byzantine ivory diptych. But the work that seems to have informed his hieratic image most directly was Jan van Eyck's depiction of God the Father from his early 15th century masterpiece, The Ghent Altarpiece. To begin with, there's something slightly unhinged about uh, equating a mortal with the deity, whatever flattery might recommend. Further, the brilliant, saturated colors of the Van Eyck, the hieratic pose and gestures, the scintillating ornamentation of his robes and surroundings, the oriental richness of the enamel-like canvas as a whole, teeming with jewel-like detail over every square centimeter, all find their echo in Ang's depiction. Nor did he need to travel to Ghent to see his model. Only recently, the altarpiece had been brought to Paris and hung in the Louvre, the loot of conquest. If Van Eyck's painting was a masterpiece of me medieval art, worthy of the Imperial Museum, however, it was not an acceptable model for a contemporary artist to follow. The critics were unforgiving. As one castigated Ang, artists like Jean de Bruges, Jan van Eyck, uh, were almost entirely ignorant <coughs> of what has since become so well known, the ideal in the arts of imitation. Art had progressed and, it, and achieved its apotheosis in classical idealism. It was unacceptable of Ang to regress uh, by evoking productions of less perfect ages. Uh, let us look briefly at another example of the ways in which hints of something bizarre creeped into even the most seemingly conventional of Ang's early works. About 1804, he received the commission to paint a trio of portraits uh, depicting a wealthy merchant, Monsieur Philibert Riviere, his wife Sabine, and daughter Caroline. The portrait of Philibert need not detain us. Throughout his career, and with exceptions as we shall see, female sitters provoked in Ang his most striking originality. Here, young Caroline's image on the right derives from portraits of Italian noblewomen by Leonardo da Vinci. Her gaze, tentative like the teenager she is, is hardly a match for the ermine cloak that swamps her, while her ochre gloves seem to have almost more personality than she herself can muster. It is not a kind portrait, but it is a perceptive one. Her mother shows no such lack of nouveau riche self-confidence. She sinks languorously into velvet cushions. A cashmere shawl is wrapped around her body like a serpent. Her eccentric black ringlets are no less animated, nor is the veil that fans, fans out across the back of the settee like a transparent jellyfish in the sea. Ang's extraordinary technical dexterity in the depiction of textures of various intertwined fabrics is brilliantly at play here. Indeed, as with Napoleon enthroned, the obsessive fascination with rich cloth stuffs almost overwhelms the image. Madame Riviere's fingers are boneless, her arms, cushions as soft as the velvet one she leans on, rings and bracelets pinch the flesh. Does this woman indeed have a skeleton? And if you look at her right arm, it is far longer than the left one. It would almost drag on the ground were she to stand up. Even here, in a formal portrait intended to please bourgeois sitters, Ang is prepared to manipulate physical reality in order to make a compelling visual statement. This indifference to physical reality when picture making demands it, a profoundly anti-classical stance, is a constant feature of his portrait career. His Grand Odalisque of 1814, with the impossibly sinuous long back, swelling buttocks, and exotic or orientalisant uh, details is simply the most famous example uh, in his long career 
of Aang's willingness to sacrifice the rules of naturalism on which the ca classical canon is based uh, for the interests of achieving beautiful effects on two-dimensional surfaces. By the time the critics turned against uh, his Napoleon enthroned in 1806, Aang was on his way to Italy, uh, the Italy he had longed to see since his youth. He had won the Prix de Rome in 1801 for the ambassadors of Agamemnon. The subject from ancient history was rendered in pure classical style, and the jury was persuaded that yet another student of Monsieur David's had shown himself worthy of advanced artistic training in the cradle of antiquity and of the high Renaissance. War and, parlous, and the parlous economy of the time prevented Ang from taking up his post at the Académie de France in Rome for five long years. The imperial portrait and those of the Riviere family we have seen were the fruits of his interminable wait in Paris until he could leave for the south. It was during this interregnum that David had finally had enough of Ang's eccentricities and broke with him. Now, however, he was on his way to the Villa Medici on the Pincian Hill in Rome. He was, he was meant to return to France in 1810, but from May of 1809, Italy was itself French and Rome under Napoleonic occupation. Indeed, Napoleon so favored his Italian conquest that he named the Eternal City the second capital of the, of the empire and dubbed his young son and heir the King of Rome. Ang decided to stay on. Here, he could find a steady and lucrative uh, stream of commissions for portraits of the leading figures of the imperial administration. One such was Monsieur Le Baron de Norvin, whom you see on the screen, a Scarpia-like figure who had been sent south as the chief of police. Ang captured his thin-lipped cruelty and shrewdness with merciless precision. He also inadvertently captured the vagaries, indeed the hypocrisies, of the historical moment. On a tabletop, uh, to Norvan's right is a bust inscribed Roma, registering Norvan's link to the city to which his ascent in the imperial administration had brought him. In fact, the bronze is a late addition to the painting. Originally, the chief of police was flanked to his upper right by a marble bust of the young king of Rome. It would have been there, and in this detail, if you look you can just see the head of a child in marble coming through the, uh, coming through the curtain. Uh, you can just make out his ghostly face. With the fall of Napoleon in 1814, however, Norvin saw the political expediency of having the sign of allegiance to the emperor and his dynastic pretensions effaced. It was painted over with red damask, one assumes by an obliging Ang himself, uh, the bust of Rome, Roma added. Only the passage of time and the tendency of oil paint to become transparent over the years allows us now to see through the red fabric to this vital trace of the original painting. Imperial Rome also offered opportunities for more ambitious commissions, the kind to establish a young artist's reputation. One such was for the imperial suite uh, in Napoleon's Roman headquarters, the Palazzo Quirinale. It was to be decorated with works linking ancient Roman and Northern European uh, history and mythology. Ang received two prestigious commissions for the palace. This enormous painting uh, for the Empress's sitting room shows the defeat of King Akron, who has launched his armies against King Romulus. Romulus was the founder of Rome, just as Napoleon styled himself its restaurateur, hence the arcane choice of subject, uh, which would not have been Ang's, but that of the Emperor's learned artistic advisors. 
Uh, and uh, to give you an idea of the scale of this picture, I show you this marvelous drawing uh, showing Ang executing the work uh, in the tribune of the church of uh, Santa Trinita dei Monte, uh, immediately adjacent to the Villa Medici. Here, Ang's uh, eclectic fascination with earlier and alternative traditions of painting was put to good use. The painting, which was meant to be seen from below and afar in a vast chamber of the palace, is oil on canvas, but entirely executed with muted, almost pastel colors to suggest that it is a fresco painted directly on the wall using some egg-based medium. To suggest as well that it is very old uh, and has faded over time. This image is much too hot. Um, when you see the, the picture in reality. Uh, the figures are simplified. Few details of shading or decoration are delineated. Rather, the broad gestures, rigid profile poses of the principles, dramatic simplified forms broadcast the meaning from a distance. Romulus conquering Akron is evidence, corroborated by his letters and sketches as well, that in Rome, Ang did not restrict his studies to antique sculpture and the acknowledged masterpieces of high Renaissance art, but as he had in Paris, continued to seek out alternative models of picture making. For example, we know that when he passed through Florence on his way to Rome, he studied the 15th century frescoes of Masaccio, and when he traveled to Naples in 1814 to paint Napoleon's sister, Queen Caroline Murat, he journeyed on to Pompeii to study the ancient Roman frescoes there. Here we see the fierce originality of Ang's approach. Not only does this huge painting argue for a supposed historic link between Romulus and Napoleon, but it presents itself to us as the kind of painting that Romulus himself might have gazed upon. A new species of historicism enters Ang's art. Painting an ancient Roman theme, he evokes the very way the ancient Romans painted. The idealism of the classical tradition, held to be timeless and immutable, is challenged here by historical relativity. Similarly, a few years later in 1821, by then Ang had relocated to Florence, he was commissioned by a French friend to paint a scene from medieval French history, the entry into Paris of the Dauphin, the future king, Charles IV. It is set in the year 1358. We are in the high Middle Ages, and to execute the painting, Ang consulted works of medieval French history and what rem remnants of medieval French art he could find in order to detail uh, the, to render the details of costume and architecture with historical accuracy. More importantly, he studied medieval French illuminated manuscripts by such artists as Jean Fouquet. He entered fully into the stylistic vocabulary, vocabulary of the age he was depicting. Here, he self-consciously emulates the crowded, flat, slightly stilted manner of painting of the mid medieval manuscript illuminators before the rules of single point perspective, an invention of the 15th century, had taken hold. As with Romulus, historicism, that is to say the visual approximation of the style of the historical moment depicted, is his prime aesthetic motivation. Pure classicism is, is blithely set aside. To make a simple distinction, when in 1821, Ang paints a scene set in Paris in 1358, he makes it look like a French work of art of the 14th century. When 13 years later, Delaroche paints a scene set in London in 1553, he also uses historical details of costume and setting, but he does not make it look like an English painting of the mid 16th century. Rather, he makes it look photographic. That is an anachronistic term, of course, but what Delaroche does is to exploit the contemporary tools of realism, and they were becoming increasingly hyper-realistic in the 1820s and 30s, to enhance a very modern sense 
of actuality. Both are historical scenes, but only the former is historicizing. This is at the heart of Aang's evolving conception of beauty and why, as you will remember, he suffered nightmares when in 1834 Delaroche's painting received all the praise, his own much more conceptually rigorous work, almost none. This free and easy movement across the various modes of painting, although for Aang, painting was never easy, he suffered agonies of uncertainty with every brushstroke, set him apart from the other artists who emerged from David's studio, indeed from David himself. Increasingly for Aang, classical beauty as represented by the art of antiquity and of the high renaissance of Raphael and Michelangelo that beauty which had been the, the subject of instruction in David's studio was one option for him among many. When it suited the subject, he used it. When not, not. In this, he was far ahead of his contemporaries. Perhaps it was only because he was working out of view of the most censorious Paris critics and con connoisseurs in the relative backwaters of Paris and Florence, of Rome and Florence, that he was able to indulge this highly original penchant for aesthetic relativism. Ang's fame today relies less on his history paintings than it does on his ravishing portraits, both drawings and paintings. Many of us find them uncanny in their technical perfection. What do, what do they reveal about his singular sense of beauty? I want to suggest that just as he changed the mode depending on the nature of the historical, historical subject he was depicting, he changed his portrait style depending on the nature of his relationship with his sitter. This is not unknown in the history of portraiture, but with Aang, it becomes something like a system. Madame de Senon, whom you see here, is 31 years of age. She was originally from Lyon and had come to Rome with her first husband early in the century. They divorced there, and she was now the mistress of the wealthy Monsieur le Vicomte de Senon. He was paying for the portrait. Later, back in Paris after the fall of Napoleon, they would marry, much to the dismay of the Vicomte's aristocratic family. It is, it is one of Ang's most elegant portraits, also one of his coldest. No evidence of brushwork is to be seen as he builds up layers of enamel-like color with small, precise touches of pigment. His scintillating skill in depicting fabrics, including the red velvet, white satin, and lace of Madame de Senon's neo-Renaissance gown, and the ochre velvet of the wall covering is ostentatious. Her head, hair pulled back, is a perfect oval. Her gaze gives nothing away. As we have seen him do before, here Aang exaggerates physiognomy for aesthetic uh, effect. Her right arm, too, uh, laid languorously on her lap, is far longer than her left. It accentuates the sense of indolent ease that permeates the painting. Aang did not know Madame de Senon well before he was commissioned to paint her. They did not have occasion to socialize in the socially stratified French community in Napoleonic Rome but he did not approve of her. Petit bourgeois in origin, utterly conventional in his domestic arrangements, kept women were not to his taste. In a brilliant reading, the English costume historian, Aileen Ribeiro, has shown us exactly how sotto voce and communicates this attitude to us. I look at two details that uh, uh, Professor Ribeiro points to. First, she simply wears too much jewelry, including multiple rings on just about every finger, jeweled earrings, a tiara, and numerous expensive baubles dangling around her neck or pinned to her dress. They are, he implies, the rewards of her dissipation. And here is evidence of Aang's cruelty. It's this detail here. <clears throat> 
His signature appears, cleverly enough, on the carte de visite tucked into the frame of the mirror behind Madame de Senon. It, as it, it is as if it were there, however, to remind her of an assignation. For as Ribeiro points out, according to the rules of the etiquette of the age, very much enforced in Rome, uh, to stick a note into a mirror frame would have been seen as louche, a small but telling hint of her essential vulgarity. The icy perfection of Aang's scintillating details uh, are here, uh, but they are the in index of his psychic distance from the sitter. This portrait dates from the exact same year as Madame de Senon. The sitter is a year, only a year older than her. She is Aang's own wife, Madeleine Chapelle. They had married only in December 1813. They had never met before her arrival in Rome from the French provinces a month earlier. She had been recommended to him by a cousin. Ang wrote and proposed she came. It was, for some 35 years, a blissfully content and happy marriage. And this portrait of his new bride reveals that it was already so. Where everything about La Senon is hard and cold and distant, Madeleine is warm, sweet, delicate, approachable. The brilliant, chill colors of the former portrait give way to a monochrome composition which projects intimacy and directness. Where the former portrait is a magnificent contrivance, this one is utterly simple and beguiling for it. The very style changes with broad, open, and visible brushstrokes. We see Ang's engagement in it. Whole areas of the painting remain unfinished, as if to say the relationship is ongoing. For Ang, love and intimacy are expressed by painterly painting. Not long after, Ang painted an extraordinary nude image of his pregnant wife. The pregnancy did not come to term, nor did the painting survive. We know it only from this undated photograph. The painting behind the nude, you see it peeking through the easel, the painting behind the nude is his Madame Watessier in black, now in the National Gallery of Art, Washington. We know he, he was at work on it in his Paris studio in 1852. Therefore, he must have kept this intimate, unsparing frontal glimpse of his beloved wife for decades, long after she had died, perhaps disposing of it only when he remarried. But he did not dispose of the photo. It is as if, in portraying a loved one, he has moved beyond the strategies of art to something almost unbearably direct and personal. He is willing here to dispense with the veil of style. At the same time as he exec executed dauntingly complicated paintings of wondrous complexity, he could, when the occasion called for it, revert to this mode as well. His concept of beauty was dazzlingly wide and inclusive. To take just another example briefly, the man on the left is Paul Lemoyne, a dear friend of Ang's and a fellow artist in the French expatriate community in Rome. Count Gurdjieff on the right was a grand Russian aristocrat on his grand tour, completely unknown to Ang when he sought him out in Florence to commission this swaggering portrait. As these, albeit extreme examples, indicate, not only uh, could Ang capture the psychology of his sitters as well as their social status, uh, but with subtle economy, he could reveal to us his emotional and moral relationship with his sitters. It is more difficult to detect the change in tone in Ang's portrait drawings. The style and the astonishing mastery of line, technical dexterity of the highest order, remain the same. But it is there. All of the sitters here are members of the Letier family. Ang sketched them in Rome. He knew them well. 
Uh, in the case of the children, he knew them from birth. Uh, when they sat to him, they sat to a family friend. Guillaume, on the left, was the director of the Academy de France at the Villa Medici during much of the time Ang studied there. From respect for a superior and admiration for a fellow artist, uh, Ang's regard for Latier had grown into warm friendship. He is a formidable presence, to be sure, but it is a speaking likeness as well. Uh, Ang depicts a warm and affectionate man with whom he seems to be engaged in amusing conversation. His, his Latier's son and daughter-in-law uh, are depicted on the center sheet. Ang's affection for them and for their domestic menage is no less palpable. A few years later, he, he sketched another son, Charles, Charles, enthroned on, enorm, on an enormous Louis XV armchair. Again, the mood is amused, affectionate, informal. He is charmed by the innocence of childhood when confronted by the confusions of the adult world. Now, Rome had been a closed shop throughout the years of Napoleonic occupation. Only the French could visit, but none of the many other Europeans with whom France was at war were able to come to Rome for a good 10 years. With the fall of Napoleon in 1814, the borders were open once again, and tourists began to pour into the Eternal City uh, from which they had for so long been barred. Prominent among them were the British. Whereas the portrait drawings of the previous decade had been primarily a fellow Frenchman like the Letier family with whom he shared a language and was often friends, now Eng was receiving commissions to make sketches of people whom he had never met before, with whom he only engaged for the two or three hours they sat for him, whom he would never see again, and this is perhaps decisive, with whom he did not share a language. The drawings took on a different, a more detached quality. Here on the left, we have the wealthy Mr. Woodhead, his much younger and more socially prominent wife, and her 18-year-old brother along for the honeymoon proud of his smart mil military uniform and insufferable in a uniquely English public school way. Ang can only rely on their comportment to understand them. He becomes a bit of a caricaturist, observing the way, for example, the way here she curls her uh, her arm around his. It's like a hook that has caught a fish. He notices this, this and then ever so slightly he exaggerates uh, the uh, gesture to comic effect. All three stare at the little man sketching them with haughty condescension and he captures that note of smugness too. Ang's consummate technical skills take on a biting edge when confronted by the strangeness of strangers. I have only looked this evening at works from the first half of Ang's long career, from about 1800, as he waited in Paris to journey to Rome, to his return to Paris in triumph in 1824, to the public failure a decade later of his saint symphorien altarpiece. He would live another 33 years until 1867, and he would continue to produce astonishing art until the end. By then, he was considered the father of French art by some, an entirely anachronistic relic of the past by many others. It was during the early years, however, years of almost constant struggle and doubt, that he forged his unique ideas of beauty and then used them in the service of his art. The classical ideal was at their heart, but almost unique in his time, he was willing and excited to explore other kinds of picture making, other concepts of beauty, and to see where they took him. 
from ancient Rome to the Middle Ages to the High Renaissance, indeed in his final years, remarkably enough, to photo-based art. But that is another story. He also learned to inscribe himself in his art in a remarkably modern way, especially in his portraits, so that if we look carefully enough, he will whisper to us exactly what he thinks of the people he's observing. Thank you very much. Thank you.